Okay, let's begin. Uh, here we are, Leviticus for Beginners, Training for Holiness. That's the name of our series and uh, subtitle of our series. Uh, this particular lesson today, Attaining Holiness, Sin and Guilt Offerings. Uh, uh, in Leviticus 4 and 5, this is part one. We've got several parts to do uh, in discussing the uh, sin and the guilt offerings. So we've noted that the uh, book of Leviticus uh, provides instructions for training in holiness, especially through the, um, the proper manner of offering sacrifices to God by an anointed uh, uh, priesthood. The book itself is conveniently divided into two sections. Talked about this before. First section, attaining holiness through various uh, practices and people. And then the second part, practicing holiness by maintaining one's religious obligations. Now the reason for all of this uh, was that if Israel was to be the exclusive people belonging to a holy God, well they themselves had to be a holy people. Leviticus was God's instructions in how to go about doing that, how to go about being God's holy people. Um, so far in our study, we have looked at the first manner in which one attained holiness, and that was through various types of offerings. There were five types uh, that were described. There was the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering. So we've looked at the first three types of sacrifices or offerings. Today we're going to begin to examine the sin offering, that's the fourth one, and the requirements expected from the different people who came to make the sin offering, Leviticus chapter four. So at this point, sin and guilt offerings things tend to become a little repetitive and sometimes confusing because there seems to be several kinds of sacrifices all for the same thing, for sin. So here's a way to differentiate each sacrifice or offering and its relationship to sin. First of all, the peace offerings were not mandatory. A peace offering was a request for God to look favorably on the weak and dependent worshiper. You know, it was saying to God, please have mercy on me, God. I, I'm, I'm a sinner, I'm weak, I need your help. The peace offering was for that type of request. The burnt offering also was not mandatory. Uh, it was a request for forgiveness and mercy in general. Uh, a little bit like uh, the uh, Our Father, the prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, uh, well, the, uh, the burnt offering was uh, somewhat like that. The sin offering was uh, mandatory. It was a petition for the forgiveness of a particular sin. Someone did a particular thing. Uh, he, he, he said a lie. He, he, he lied to his wife about something serious. All right? So the sin offering was for a particular sin. The guilt offering was for sin, but it was for a, um, uh, uh, the forgiveness of a particular kind of sin. In other words, a pattern of sinfulness. You know, you offered the sin offering for a sin that you did, a lie that you, that you spoke. You offered a guilt offering because you realized that you're a liar, that you're a dishonest person, you're a merchant and you've not been you know, honest. In, in, in the way you treat your clients, or you've not been honest with your family, or you have a lustful heart, you know, a kind of an ongoing weakness, an ongoing sinful condition. Uh, perhaps you're lazy. Uh, so the, the, the guilt offering was to acknowledge guilt for you know, a condition. A sin offering uh, was an offering for a particular sin that you had committed. So let's read uh, Leviticus chapter four, verses one and two. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel saying, if a person sins unintentionally in any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and commits any of them. And so God introduces the next category of offerings, the sin offering to be required where a true sin has been committed and 
specifies in verse two that this sacrifice is required even for unintended sins. Uh, sins that are committed, a sin that is committed in ignorance, sins which were not premeditated, for example. So sin was always you know, breaking God's laws and commands, even if done without knowledge or done on the spur of the moment or as the result of a provocation. It was still sin. However, the sin offering was not sufficient to forgive capital offenses like blasphemy or murder or adultery for which the penalty was death. There was no sin offering for that. We read about that in Leviticus chapter 20 and further on in Deuteronomy 22 confirms that idea. Once God establishes the need to deal with sin through sacrifice to atone for sin, he does not provide a list of sins that require a sin offering. I mean, after all, breaking God's laws, disobeying His commands, each instance of these is sin and requires atonement and uh, forgiveness. So, no list of sins are given, but rather four categories of sinners, along with instructions on how each of them were to go about seeking forgiveness. This is the approach. Because I mean, if you start listing sins, I mean, you'd have a long, long list, right? So instead he, he, he names four categories of sinners to help differentiate which type of sacrifice needs to be offered for which type of sin. And so he begins, first of all, with a sin offering for the anointed priest, chapter four, verses three to 12, because even the, even the priests, you know, they're, they're people, they sin always. Uh, they sin also rather. So uh, they begin with a sin offering for the anointed priest. This actually referred to the high priest himself whose sin brought guilt and condemnation on the people that he represented. The priest had to offer the most expensive offering, a bull without defect, and he followed the procedure that we have already looked at in studying the steps in presenting a burnt offering. You know, most, most of the um, offerings followed a similar procedure. There were certain changes, you know, but most of them followed the same procedure. So when the priest sinned, when the priest was offering for the high priest, okay, this is what, this is the, uh, this is the uh, um, procedure uh, that he followed. First, he brought the animal to the entrance of the tabernacle. He laid his hands on the bull, signifying the transfer of his sin to the animal. Uh, he killed the bull, slaughtered the animal. He then sprinkled the blood of the bull seven times in front of the veil of the Holy of Holies. That's inside, okay? Not, in, not inside the Holy of Holies, but inside the holy place uh, where the curtain was, right there. He, um, uh, he sprinkled uh, the blood in uh, that uh, place seven times. Uh, also, he put the blood of the, on the horns or the corner of the altar of incense. He poured the rest of the blood out at the base of the altar of burnt offerings, which was in the courtyard. So the bull was slain, the blood was taken inside the holy place offered in front of the veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, also on the four corners of the altar of incense, which was in front of the, of the veil. And then he went back outside and uh, he poured uh, the blood uh, you know, uh, in front of the, uh, of the uh, altar of burnt uh, offerings. Then uh, he was to burn the fat parts of the animal on the altar, of uh, burnt uh, offerings. And unlike uh, other burnt offerings where you know, the other edible parts of the animal were left on the altar of burnt offerings, for the priest's sin, uh, for his offering, only the fat parts were burned on the altar. The hide, the head, the flesh, the legs, the entrails, the refuse, were all taken to a ceremonially clean place outside the tabernacle complex and burned to ashes. The idea here was that the priest would not profit in any way. In other words, he wouldn't keep the hide or he wouldn't eat any of the flesh from the offering of the animal for his sin. 
the symbolism of the sin offering for the high priest, the laying on of hands, of course, transferred the sin uh, to the animal. It identified with the doomed animal as the doomed sinner. The death of the animal represented death of the sinner whose sin is not forgiven. The sprinkling of the blood was an appeal to God to accept the sacrifice for sin. And then the burning of the animal outside the camp signified that the sin had been removed from the priest as well as from the people. All right, sin offering for the, so that was the sin offering for the high priest. Next is the sin offering for the congregation. In Leviticus chapter four, verses 13 and 14, we read about the sin offering for the congregation. It says the following. Now, if the whole congregation of Israel commits error and the matter escapes the notice of the assembly and they commit any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and they become guilty, when the sin which they have committed becomes known, then the assembly shall offer a bull of the herd for a sin offering and bring it before the tent of meeting. So there would be times when the nation as a whole would disobey God's command, uh, falling into idolatry, for example. There is something where the whole community would be guilty. Or uh, perhaps they failed to carry out their duties. They neglected a Sabbath uh, worship uh, or other um, necessities uh, of their religion. In cases like this, God would raise up a prophet or a leader to exhort the people. And part of the repentance process would be to offer a sin offering on behalf of the nation. The leaders would bring a bull to the entrance of the tabernacle and the same procedure would be followed as the sin offering for the priests. They'd kill the bull, they'd sprinkle, sprinkle the blood, they, they, you know, they, they'd bring the rest of it outside of the camp, you know, same procedure. All right, let's talk about a sin offering this time uh, for a leader of the people. Leviticus 4, 22 and 3, it says, when a leader sins and unintentionally does any one of all the things which the Lord his God has commanded not to be done, and he becomes guilty, if his sin which he has committed is made known to him, he shall bring for his offering a goat, uh, a male without uh, defect. So the value of the animal sacrificed correlated to the ability of the one offering the sacrifice to provide, as well as the impact of the sin on the nation. The higher up you were, the worse your sin was, and the more it impacted the community, the more expensive the offering. All right, so we started with the high priest who's at the top, uh, and then the people as a whole, and now a leader of the people. So individual leaders were important. That's why they would bring a male goat without defect, but their influence not equal to the nation itself uh, as a whole or, or the high priest for that matter. The offering of the animal was similar to the previous examples, except for the following. First of all, uh, no blood was taken inside the holy place when they made this particular sacrifice. And both the fat parts and the remaining parts were put on the altar of burnt offering. Nothing was taken outside the camp. Everything was burnt on the altar. This suggests that the priest could eat the parts of the animal placed on the altar of a burnt offering. Then there is the same list that we're, you know, we're working our way down the same list. This time, sin offering, not for the priests or congregation or leader, but for the common people in Leviticus chapter four. Let's read those verses. Verse 27, it says, Now if any one of the common people sins unintentionally in doing any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done and becomes guilty, if his sin which he has committed is made known to him, then he shall bring for his offering a goat, a female, without defect for his sin which he has committed. And in verse 32 it says, but if he brings a lamb as his offering for a sin offering, he shall bring it a female without defect. So the common people, not a priest, not a leader, who repented of their sin, 
had a choice of bringing either a female goat or a female lamb without defect as a sin offering. These were less expensive to obtain than a male goat or a male, uh, a male lamb. This animal, as I said, was less expensive, well, less expensive than bulls or goats uh, that were required from priests and leaders. The offering for this person followed the same procedure as the male goats where the entire animal was placed on the altar of burnt offering, thus allowing the priests to eat part of the uh, animal. In Leviticus chapter four, verse 31b, it says, thus the priest shall make atonement for him and he will be forgiven. So even this more modest offering, a female lamb, for example, if it was done according to God's instructions, it produced a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord, which resulted in atonement for the sin, and of course, uh, the important thing, forgiveness for the, uh, for the sinner. Leviticus chapter five, we need to continue reading verses one to six. Uh, it says, now if a person sins after he hears a public adjuration to testify when he is a witness, whether he has seen or otherwise known, if he does not tell it, then he will bear his guilt. Or if a person touches any unclean thing, whether a carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of un unclean cattle or a carcass of unclean swarming things, though it is hidden from him and he is unclean, then he will be uh, guilty. We keep reading. Or if he touches human uncleanness of whatever sort his uncleanness may be with which he becomes unclean and it is hidden from him and then he comes to know it, he will be guilty. Or if a person swears thoughtlessly with his lips to do evil or to do good in whatever manner a man may speak thoughtlessly with an oath and it is hidden from him and then he comes to know it, he will be guilty in one of these. So it shall be when he becomes guilty in one of these that he shall confess that in which he has sinned. He shall also bring his guilt offering to the Lord for his sin which he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat as a sin offering, so the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his sin. All right, so this section that we read here elaborates on the kinds of sins that required a sin offering. Three examples are given. First of all, someone fails to act as a witness. In other words, someone fails to speak up when uh, they know the truth of a matter which is being judged uh, and witnesses are sought. No matter how they acquire the information, if they refuse, if they neglect or forget to come forward, they're guilty of sin. Another case, um, a person becomes unclean ceremonially unclean by touching something which is unclean, a dead body, a grave, and they neglect or they forget to do what is necessary to become ceremonially clean again. Or oh, the sin uh, here was not being unclean, the sin was neglecting to deal with that particular uh, situation. A third example, not fulfilling a vow. Not fulfilling a vow because it was made in haste or it was forgotten once it was made or it was broken for whatever reason, that person would also be guilty of sin. And so all three examples have the common feature of unintentional sin. Sin through neglect, sin through forgetfulness, but not premeditated sin. So a person may not have been aware that his witness was necessary or that he had become unclean somehow. He didn't realize he had touched something unclean. Perhaps he made a hasty promise, which was also hastily uh, forgotten. The law made no excuses for forgetting or neglecting these things. The individual still had to acknowledge that they were guilty of sin. The person was still required to offer the appropriate sacrifice for atonement and forgiveness. A female lamb or a female goat was offered in the same manner as the offering for the common people. And then we read about, last category, uh, poor people, sin offering for poor people. Poor people uh, commit sins similar to common or rich uh, people. 
but could not afford the required animal sacrifices, so they could offer less expensive creatures. For example, a turtle dove, which were a smaller species of doves, whose name was derived from the sound that they made when they were calling out. Turtle doves or pigeons uh, could be offered, two, two pigeons. So two birds were required, one uh, particularly, uh, partially sacrificed rather, leaving a portion for the priest, and the other bird totally burnt up, leaving nothing for the priest. In this way, a sacrifice made with a larger animal was duplicated using two small birds. Each followed the order of sin offering made for the common uh, people. Always amazing. Uh, different animals, different cost, but always the same procedure for the same, uh, for the same end, for the same result. Uh, as I mentioned before, the high priest offered a bull, uh, a very poor person offered uh, two birds, and yet both were forgiven of sin. We have a, a last category, and that is sin offering for the poorest of people. For those too poor to obtain even two turtle doves or pigeons, uh, they still had to make an offering for their sins. For this group, God permitted them to offer fine flour made from barley grain, a tenth of an ephah, uh, which was about six pounds of, of flour. No oil, no frankincense uh, was added since this was an offering for sin not a grain offering for peace or thanksgiving. And so uh, a handful was thrown on the altar with other sacrifices burning there. That was called a memorial offering. The rest of the flour was kept by the priest for his use. We read in Leviticus 5.13, it says, so the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his sin, which he has committed from one of these, and it'll be forgiven him, then the rest shall become the priests like the grain offering. Again, note that when done properly, the same result of atonement and forgiveness for the sinner was achieved, even only just a handful of fine flour. So whether it was a thousand pound bull ox without blemish or a handful of baking flour, when it was offered by a repentant heart, according to God's command, atonement for sin was made and forgiveness for the sinner was the final uh, result. So we've reviewed the six different groups of people who would offer sin offerings said to be required as a pattern to God for a particular sin. We noted that the type and manner of sin offering differed based on the category of the person offering the sacrifices. Uh, what you offered was based on who you were, for example, whether you were a priest or a leader, a com the common person, a poor person, or even the poorest of people, uh, those were the categories that we uh, looked at, and the nation, of course. In the end, uh, we, if, we, if we go over to the New Testament, in the end, Paul's statement in Romans 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, describes the situation quite clearly. Everybody sins. Everybody sins and is, you know, falls short of the glory of God. Uh, even the, the high priest down to the poorest person uh, is guilty of sin and needs, you know, needs a sacrifice uh, to atone for his sin and obtain forgiveness. So this elaborate, complex and cumbersome system was only a preview of what was to come, a way that would accomplish the same results atonement and forgiveness, but accomplish it in a much more dynamic way and for a greater number of disparate people, not just for a single nation. In our next lesson, we'll examine the fourth type of offering made for sin, and that is the guilt offering. As we close out this lesson, I'd like to make a few observations about the sin offering first. The sin offering, 
was a new development in the religion of Israel. It was introduced in Exodus chapter 29, verses 14 and 36, also in chapter 30, verse 10. Prior to this, the burnt offering was used for sins. For example, Job made a burnt offering in case his children may have sinned and cursed God in their hearts, Job chapter one, verse five. The burnt offering was an ancient practice that was used for thanks, like in the case of Cain and Abel, and it was used uh, for other uh, communication with God. Abraham, for example, made a burnt offering, Genesis 22. Now that God's laws were codified, you know, the Ten Commandments, and the book of the law was given, and a, a formal place and method of worship was also given, as well as a distinct and clearer instruction was needed not only to determine what sin was, but a distinct way was necessary for the people to deal with corporate and personal sin. And so God calls upon the people to be holy as He is, and He gives them a law which will reveal their sins and unholy practices and behavior. You can't be holy unless you know what not being holy is. You know, in order to know what holy is, you have to know what unholy is. And so God gives more information about that to Moses in order to pass on uh, to the people. So God calls upon the people to be holy as He is and then gives them the law which will reveal their sins and unholy practices and behavior. These, uh, excuse me, there needed to be a way for them to unburden themselves of the sure guilt and personal suffering that this knowledge would bring. It's not enough to just give the law and to demonstrate you know, what your sins were. That would have been terrible if that's the only thing God gave the, uh, the Israelites because they would be aware of sin and it would just continue to pile on and pile on. And they would be carrying a burden of guilt and fear. But God provided the sin and guilt offering system as a temporary way to deal with sin atonement and forgiveness uh, by the sacrificial system until he brought about the final solution through Jesus Christ. And so this system that we're studying and that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, was only a temporary system. I mean, it, it went on for a long, long time, for centuries, but it was only a temporary system. It was only a preview of what was to come. Um, another observation, uh, no excuses and no exceptions. When it came to sin, there were no excuses, whether the sin was done knowingly or by mistake or through negligence or forgetfulness. When a sin occurred privately or nationally, it had to be atoned for and it had to be forgiven. The one who presented a sin offering did so by first acknowledging responsibility for the sin. You know, nothing has changed, the same today. Uh, the person bringing the animal you know, to the tabernacle entrance you know, to the priest first had to say, Lord, I'm guilty of such and such and I'm sorry and I'm bringing this, you know, this sacrifice. Note also that there were provisions for everyone in the sin guilt offerings from the, the king and the nation to the high priest, to local leaders and common people, as well as the poorest of poor citizens. Everybody had a way to obtain atonement and forgiveness. As Paul said, and I mentioned before, all have sinned and the sin and the guilt offerings made provision so that all could make atonement and all could receive forgiveness and the blessings that came with forgiveness. And so speaking of blessings that came uh, with forgiveness, as I close out the lesson, I want to give you a little exercise to be thinking about just for yourself in private. You won't have to show this to anyone. We're not going to ask anyone to read theirs or send theirs in, but I want you to write down words that describe how you felt after you were baptized. How did you feel after you were baptized? What thoughts went through your mind? 
And also write down in kind of diary form, you know, to yourself, how you felt when you uh, acknowledge sin as a Christian and, and, and ask God for forgiveness, or perhaps you came forward at church and, and, and acknowledged a fault or a, a weakness or a sin where you needed help and forgiveness in the prayers of the church. What words would describe how you felt after that took place? And then the other exercise I give you is just a reading plan. Uh, I encourage you to read uh, chapters five, six, and seven uh, in Leviticus. You may have already read it, but I want you to read it again and be familiar with the text because that'll be the subject of our uh, lesson uh, next time uh, we get together. Well, that's it for today. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next time. God bless.